I relocated the computer to a new spot. Third time's the charm. Hit us, Doc. That's the third time I got kicked out. No Are you doing this to mess yeah. with me? Uh, oops. <laughs> April Fools. No, no, no. <laughs> no, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so I want to show um, a particular way that I like to open my guard when the person is bigger or stronger or I just I feel like I'm losing my closed guard position. Um, I know a lot of people like to play with the collar and the pants grips, but generally I used a lot of my attacks from the double sleeve grip. I'm just getting my closed guard. So a lot of times from here, can you see good? Can you see my knees in here? Yeah. A lot of times from here, the person like grabs the belt. Can you guys hear me good? Maybe, no. Yeah. And then they dig their elbows in and they start trying to pass from here. And it's really easy to lose position. So what I like to do to open my guard, can you pick your arms up so they can see? I open my guard and right now I'm on like both butt cheeks. What I do is switch to just one butt cheek. So I have my knee inside his ribs and the back of my other knee on the ribs. So it's really just like one side shrimp to the side. And I do that from when I have the grips. So I come to the side and I bring that knee inside and I take the arm with my knee. And then I go to the other side. So what I'm doing is stabbing him with the tip of my knee into his ribs. And I use that knee to open the arms. And now I have all my control here. I have both feet on the hips. I have both knees inside the elbows. I'm flaring my legs out and I'm pulling with my grips and I'm pushing with my feet. So I have three points of contact and I can move around. Let me pick your arms up so they can see. So I turn myself to the side. I use the point of my knee into the ribs and then I dig to take the arm. So even if the person puts their elbows in, I take it with my knee. This is a really strong position from here. Can we see if somebody has a question about that? That was beautiful. If you could just do me a favor, if possible, can you guys give us a side view? From a side view? Can you pick your arms up first? So from here, I'm on like both butt cheeks and I shrimp to be on one butt cheek. So I've got the point of one knee and the back of the other knee on the ribs. I'm still putting some pressure here. So I'm not being lazy with either leg, but I started from, from square with both butt cheeks on the floor and I moved to just one side. The knee that's poking into the ribs is the one that's gonna dig and take that arm. So when they start burying their elbows, trying to put pressure and open their guard, it comes sideways and I take it with my knee. I can even do it without my hands. Put your elbows in this one hand. I can get my knee in there. So I don't need the strength of my arm against their arm. I use my leg against their arm, so my leg should be stronger. Can we see if someone has a question about? Guys, if you have any questions for Professor Olivia, please throw it in the chat. But I just wanted to highlight, that's such an amazing little detail that I haven't really gone over yet. But being able to swim that knee through to peel the arm away from the body is huge. And then maintaining the pressure with both legs to control the guard, that's awesome. I'm definitely going to drill that as soon as we get back on the mats. I love it. Uh, we don't have any questions coming in. Um, if you guys want to drill, if you have a partner, the professors, oh, uh, Professor or Cooch, sorry, go ahead. Cooch, Dr. Cooch. Oh, were you just, sorry, you were just waving to us. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Dr. Cooch says hello, everybody. <laughs> All right, so Olivia, sorry, you could uh, go ahead. I do, and... I do have a question, if you can hear me. Um, yes. Do you have like favorite setups? Do you go lasso? Do you go spider from there? Do you use your feet on the hips to like create space and reset? Or what are some of the things you like to do once you have that, that space back inside? Or is that just really to make sure you're the one that opens the guard and they are not opening your guard? 
Yeah, I use that so that I open the guard under my own terms. If I feel like they're about to break my guard or if I feel like they're digging their elbows in too deep, I always want my feet on the hips and my knees flared out into the elbows and my grip strong, like that's my step one. And then I see where I'm gonna go from there. It depends on what they're doing with their base, if they're sitting low or high, if they start trying to stand up or if they wanna put a knee in my butt in the middle or post out to the side, um, then I would switch to different positions from there. Um, tonight I wanted to show some triangle details and variations from there from when they just post one, one leg up. So typically when they stand up, it's one foot first. Awesome. So I'm already attacking before they even get the second foot up. Beautiful. Before we go to the triangle, Paolo is asking if you could just show us one more time, please. Yeah, sure. Um, from, you think from the side would be better? Yeah, yeah if you don't mind, the one, one more time, the side view would be great. So I think for visual purposes, it's easier if his arms are not in the way. So right now, when my guard is closed, it's the back of my knees that are on his ribs kind of like the side and the back of the knee. So whichever knee I'm gonna dig first, I shrimp to the other butt cheek and I poke that knee into the ribs. And then I dig up with that knee and I take the arm with it. So if I'm squared up and I shrimp sideways, I bring that knee in and under and use that to take the arm. So even if that elbow is real deep in there, there's just this little space in here. I just need the tip of my knee in there. And I can almost always get my knee underneath the elbow, even when they're big and their knee is, their elbow is deep, I can get my knee in there and flare it out. And then I'll switch to the other side, and bring the knee in. So this is my first spot. Um, ideally, I want both feet on the hips. If I'm just gonna like see what their reaction is. But if I just have one foot on the hip, then I can start looking for a spider hook. I can switch to the other hip and look for a lasso. And that's because he hasn't even posted a knee or tried to stand up or anything. But so this will be my base. I want both feet on the hip so I can push away. I can pull in, I can flare out. I can move him a lot just by playing with all the angles and <laughs> control here. <laughs> awesome, Paula saying thank you so much for showing us again. Uh, Bill is asking, do you have a particular name for that type of guard? I think that guard has the a name. The that you end up in there. Do you, do you call it anything or should we just call it Dr. Olivia? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I could take credit for that. Um, I don't think that position has a, a particular just open guard, just open guard. Um, if nobody's I, taking I credit it, you can take credit it's officially from this day forth it's called the dr olivia position we can say live guard too live guard <laughs> awesome all right it's like a it's like the um what do you call it like a springboard position it's the starting point for um the feet on the hips whether they're whether he stays on his knees or he stands all the way up or is halfway up with one leg, uh, feet on the hips are always a good place to start from and then you can decide where you wanna go from there. Awesome. And your go-to move from there is going to be triangle setups? I, I just wanted to show a couple fun ones and then talk about some details. We're getting a um, lot of thumbs up and a lot of head nods. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so the basic, um, let's this the basic triangle setup that most people learn first is from closed guard with a push pull, stuff one arm and wrap that leg and then grab the shin and look for the triangle. That's like the basic push pull triangle that a lot of people, I think that's like the first one everybody learned. Like we drill this, stuff one arm and look for the triangle. But you can see he's a lot bigger than me. And you can see, I kind of, I call this diamond guard. I don't really get a good triangle because he's so much bigger and my hips didn't really come up. So I changed this push pull. When I stuff the arm, I put the other foot on the hip and that helps me elevate so much higher. 
so I can really get my hips up off the ground. And I know a lot of people make a big deal about stuffing this arm to the side, but that's the last thing I worry about. When I'm looking for a triangle, the most important thing for me is that I can get this shin grip. So even if I have the worst quality diamond guard here, I want this shin grip. So even if this leg is lazy, if he tries to sit up, I'll go with him. Like, go sit up, sit up. Just because I had that shin grip. So like all the posture control is on this shin. And then that gives me all the time in the world to shrimp all, all the way to the side and lock my triangle. Keep this open so that you can breathe. <laughs> Another big detail is the feet. I hope she's just freezing and not holding Chris in that choke that long. Oh, he's going to die for that. Oh, sure. boy. Finish the chat. Uh, while we're on this commercial break, guys, I'd like to point out Professor Tom's uh, background of Bob Marley. You guys can enjoy that while Olivia logs back on. This is what I do when I miss Booyu so much and I can't see him. I just make him my background. <laughs> oh, Lord. I have too many pictures of Booyu. Some are probably not appropriate for this, but this one will work. <laughs> you see, Laura, while since Olivia is frozen right now, we can talk a little bit. I like. I like Tim's background too. I mean, it sounds, oh, look at Nacho. Nacho, watch out. So just to echo what she's saying, I actually am 100% on board with what she's saying. I am all about that. And I teach my people the same thing. Um, a lot of times I have long legs. So when I first started, uh, I used to throw up that triangle and like lock it up and think I got it. And I would never get it. I would fatigue before I would finish it. And so what she's saying about grabbing that shin and finding that angle and pinching that other leg, like I'm, I teach my people that same exact thing. I'm all about that, you know, just lock in and get that shin. And then no matter how much they go ape crazy, they're not getting out. So you got it. And, and you're, it's actually a stronger grip than trying to keep your ankles locked behind their, behind their back. Uh, so in that frozen picture she's doing, you see her, the leg that's free that she doesn't have a hold of. Um, that leg I keep tight and pinched so that they can't take that arm out and back. Uh, so that position, I, I'm 100% on board with what she's saying. I, I love that, that position. I found, bro, if I, if I rush too fast to go right into the triangle and I don't stop at that position, they, they're able to pass my guard a lot easier. Oh, uh, 100 That's why I have trust issues. <laughs> oh, she's back. She's back. back. Dr. Olivia, I'm we back. were so, I'm sorry. We were I don't so know concerned. What's we thought you were holding Chris in that position this long. We're like, oh yeah. man. I don't want to kill him. He's bad. certainly dead by now. <laughs> <laughs> so where did I freeze? It was on the on the shin grip. We were yeah. just talking about the importance of the shin grip and not getting overcommitted to the triangle itself, uh, securing that position first. Yeah, the shin grip is everything. Before I worry about the arm, before I worry about my angle, before I worry about locking the triangle or my feet position or anything, I want that shin before anything. Um, after that, I wanted to talk about the feet also. So when you're trying to close the triangle, we put the top of the ankle behind the back of the knee and people start squeezing and their feet look like little ballerina toes. But if you can see, this is what the space that I'm using to choke. And if I point my toes, you can see the space. And if I flex my feet, you can see that space get smaller. So like just this detail that your feet are super flexed, it makes that space so much smaller. And that's the space that I'm using to choke their neck. So I always pay attention to not just that my feet are flexed, but that my heels go down. So I don't know how well you can see or you can even try on your own if you just lock a triangle and point your toes and then flex your feet and bring your heels down. So it's a, it's a small detail but it really changes how much space there is to choke with. 
So for Chris's torture, <laughs> again, I go push pull. I put that foot on the hip so I can get nice elevation. I get my shin. I change my angle. And then when I get my triangle good, I want to flex my feet and bring my heels down. Come sideways. So again, when I go for the push pull, I put a foot on the hip so I can use that to elevate and get my shin. I change my angle. And when I lock the triangle, I want my feet flexed, never pointed, flexed. And then I bring my heels down. This detail, he's turning red and I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a question about that part before we do a fun one? <clears throat> Looks like we're good to go on that one. It, it, not just smaller space, but I have a question. Oh, sorry, Cooch. Is that Cooch? Um, yeah, I'd like uh, just uh, just a tiny clarification with what Tom had said with you, Olivia. Controlling the shin, I understand that part, but you made a comment how if you lose the free arm a little, it's not so important because you can go up with them. And Tom talked about pinning that arm. I, I sometimes have trouble, uh, I think, maintaining the um, knee pinch on that arm. Can you the clarify that? Do you feel like they're, they're yes. slipping the arm yeah. back out? No, no, that the using the outside, so you've got your, thank you. You've got your hand on the shin in a good spot. Their arm is in good and the head is in. The free leg, be not rushing, throwing the triangle, but making sure you get control there. And whether that free arm that's not trapped, how important is that? I really don't find that, that arm to be important at all. Um, I start, okay. I, I, I focus on locking the details of the triangle. I always want that shin grip first to control posture. And then mm -hmm. if for whatever reason, my triangle is not choking well to finish, then I start attacking the arm inside. So again, it doesn't matter to me if the arm, like they teach us to lock the triangle and then wrap the arm to the other side and then pull down on the head and squeeze. So a, a lot of people put priority on putting that arm to the other side and feel like the triangle is not complete if the arm is not brought over to the other yeah. side. But it really doesn't, yeah. To me, so, the Olivia, position Olivia, of the arm doesn't matter. If you can hear me, this is this is what uh, he's talking about. So you're talking about here, and I have the head and this arm inside, and you're grabbing the shin to keep it tight. His his issue is that he loses this arm and it comes out, right? So I I was I'm all about exactly what you say. I'm all about this, and I don't worry about bringing it across or anything like that either. I don't I don't really care. As long as I have this and I get my angle, right, then I, right. And I can keep this pitch so this arm doesn't come out and escape. And I think that's what he's talking about. He loses that, that arm that's also stuck inside there. And not necessarily like worrying about putting it across, but just that it comes out. Just keeping out. it. Yeah. Well, are you locking diamond guard before you, lock, you try to get your shin grip and lock your triangle? Like what, what guard position did you I guess have? Sometimes I feel like if, I feel like if I get to diamond guard, I've, I sort of, that shows me that I missed what I was trying to do. Was so so Cooch, maybe because of his name or whatever it is, is that he, he tends to pretend like he's giving birth rather than pinching tight. <laughs> right? So he has this and this knee is just kind of flopping open. Like, you know, we're breaking arms. So the idea is pitching that second leg. That's, uh, what, that's his challenge. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like you're getting the shin grip before you start yeah. losing that other arm? Like you have the shin and you're still losing the other arm? That means you're yes. just being lazy with that second leg and yeah, you're opening your hip too much and you need to just keep it close. I don't, I don't feel like I've ever had that problem. If I get diamond guard to me is the beginning. If I can hit diamond guard, I can lock a triangle or I can switch to omoplata on the other side every time. Um, okay. Maybe just, just really try to focus on 
keeping that second leg. Maybe you're so focused on getting your shin grip that you're forgetting about that other leg. I think that's probably true. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to remember that escape next time I roll with you, Cooch. <laughs> so it well, sounds like, I know how it sounds like it, everybody's so concurring. <laughs> everybody's concurring. That's a, that's a word that you guys use, right, Cooch? Concur? Everybody's concurring that yes. you've got to keep the posture down, keep either the ankles crossed in diamond guard or pinch the legs together. It sounds like that's going to solve your problem. And you could send Dr. Uh, Olivia a tip after class. Sure, when I, uh, when I uh, get I'm here to tap to my next triangle, I'll, I'll send you a referral fee. Holy crap. If that ever happens, bro. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, well, so Dr. A boy can dream. Do, can you show us maybe the angle of the finish? Because I know once you get that grip, um, and I don't worry about putting the arm across or anything like that too, because I concern myself much more with the angle. Um, yeah. Turning 90 with them. Can you maybe show us that or, or give us some things that maybe you do as a little trick or tip? So I lock my diamond guard, I got my shin, and then I like to come back to the hip, but I, maybe this is what Cooch is doing, he's flaring his knee out, so I don't do that. I keep it tight, but I do put my foot on the hip. I don't like to go to the floor, there's too much space. And the, the bigger the person is, the more I want to turn myself like as far as possible before I try to lock my triangle, and then I always flex my feet and bring my heels down. So if I just bring my foot back up, I lose, I give him some space to breathe. If I bring that heel down to the floor, he wants to tap, I'm sorry. And this arm, <laughs> we make, it makes such a big deal, I feel like at the lower belt, that this is a proper triangle and the arm has to be across. And then you pull on the head and lift your hips. Not that this is not a good triangle, but I really don't care the position of the arm. If they like to tuck it and hide it, that's fine. I can still finish from here. And I can also attack from here. Mm. I can get the wrist lock. I get the straight arm bar. I can look for a kimura. I'm just gonna open up so I don't choke him. There's all kinds of attacks on that arm. So anytime that you've got a good triangle, you should keep it and start attacking the arm. You okay? Yeah. Oh, so. Absolutely. Those are some awesome details. The feet flexed, controlling the and posture. And to the floor. The heels awesome. need to go down. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I see it a lot when I referee, especially people with long legs. But the intensity in competition, they get the triangle and they're locking. And they have the triangle and they're squeezing and they're doing this with their feet. Down the, the, the foot is all the way up in the air and the toes are pointed. This is not good pressure. You got to flex those, your feet and bring your heels down. All those little details added up make a huge difference. It's very important that everybody takes this to heart. This is awesome. Beautiful. All right. We do, have, we do have questions lined up for you here, uh, but I just want to make sure you get through all the material that you want to present first specifically related to triangle stuff. Okay, so I, I just have um, two um, fun or useful um, entry positions. Can we, in the guard that your back is to that. So from a closed guard position on someone who is stalling, possibly bigger or heavier, maybe up on points and they're just they're just stalling they're sitting on their butt they don't want to move it's really hard to move them and i need to make something happen i do that by forcing them to change their base by using one of my feet to hook theirs and move the foot out similar to what um that australian guy tom oh he was showing about how you take the foot and you move it to the side and it changes the position of the knee can you can you see his feet So I take his foot and I find inside his foot and I swim it out. I change the whole base like that. I could change the whole base like that. 
see? Yep, we got it. But when he moves to the side, the other leg is the one that's going to go for the triangle, but I don't have good elevation here. I'm going to abandon and elevate here. Oh, wow. You he bait him right into that triangle. That's beautiful. Yeah. Maybe a side view is better. You can also go from a spider hook, but just from closed guard, I have a lot of other options here, but when they're sitting and they're stuck and they just don't want to move, I don't, I'm not really risking anything by dropping a foot and take it out. Look how it moves. Mm. So I can use a spider hook if I want. I can play here. But that's the foot that's going to go for the triangle, but it's hard here. So I'm going to abandon that and use that foot on the hip for my elevation, my shin grip, my angle, my heels. I really like that when the person is just refusing to move and doesn't want to do anything. It's like when they're stalling, especially when they're bigger. And if they're winning and they know that they're just trying to run the clock, and I'm not risking anything by sticking my foot in there and moving their base. Should I, um, should I show you the other one? Yeah, these are awesome tips. Do you mind actually doing that one one more time, but from the other side, maybe spin around. There you go, awesome. So honestly, I work this one more, if I'm going for the triangle, I started with a spider hook, uh, but I swim my foot and I take their base. And if I can get a spider hook, like I got all kinds of stuff here. I can let go and look for the trap, they'll fall right into it. But what I do more is abandon that hook and get the foot on the hip for my elevation here. This really helps me. But just from the close guard, if, if he just sits and doesn't want to move, I don't do anything else. I just swim and find the foot look, I can like, really mess up his base just with that so i have a lot of options there i'll move the base maybe a spider hook abandon that hook for the hip so i can get good elevation the shin my angle the feet heels down <laughs> awesome before you, you go that's beautiful. But before you go on to the next one, can you just give us the order of, uh, or the sequence of movements? Are you flaring that knee out before you get your spider hook on the other side? Or is that done simultaneously? The first thing that I do is swim for that foot and flare his, his foot out. It changes the angle of his knee and forces him to move his base. Um, I like the spider hook on the other side. Um, you know, anytime you have a spider hook, you have a possible triangle threat can always slide it up and over. Um, but I, I also prefer to let go of the hook and put my foot on the hip to help me elevate, especially if the person is um, bigger. Beautiful. I need that extra elevation to get up and lock a good, at least the diamond guard. Love it. And so does everybody else on here. I'm getting a lot of messages. A lot of people are going to try this when we come back. When we come back, guys, you got to take it easy on your partner's knees, okay? A lot of you guys are excited to try this technique. <laughs> awesome, Olivia. All right, let's let's go on to the next one. Thank you. Okay, so the the last one I think um, is from um, a series that Michelle Nicolini teaches. From she calls it Shin Guard, and I've been I've been playing with it a lot. Um, it leads me right into either a a messy sweep or a triangle or an omoplata. When um, let's go sideways first. Ready. So say I open my guard and the person starts to stand up. Whichever leg they pulse, I want my shin in front of their shin. Let me see. And then I go for a spider on the opposite side. So if I, if I let go of the spider in my grips and I just try to kick this leg, it's almost impossible to pick up that leg because they're so heavy. But if I use the spider in my grips to stretch him a little to the other side, then I can pick this up. So if I stretch the spider the wrong way, I won't be able, now he's sitting on that leg. This is too heavy. But if I stretch him just 
the opposite way, just a little bit. Now I can pick this up and I can play with his base here. So if you want to drill this, you want an opposite side spider hook, then the side of the leg that's posted. You want to stretch the spider away from that side. You should feel it super light. You can pick this up. I could just throw him that way, except there's a TV there right now, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but what I really like to do, I catch them off guard. I kick this out and I let my spider slide for the triangle at the same time and they fall on me. And then I lock for my shin and look for my triangle. I catch them off guard a lot. They're looking to, so they're looking to stand up. I catch that shin and I just kick it. They fall right into my triangle. It's usually a super messy diamond guard. I get my shin and I clean it up. Let the, let the fire department drive by real quick. Can y'all hear the fire trucks? <laughs> oh no. Are we frozen? You can hear me? I can't hear. Yeah, we got you. We got okay, you. Okay, okay. You're awesome. No, I love these techniques. It seems like the, the, the opponent is just falling right into your triangle with this technique, the last technique. Uh, before we move on and we go over this technique one more time, can you please uh, answer this question for me? They're asking if pulling on the foot the way you did during the last technique would be considered a knee reap. No, the definition of the knee reap requires two things. And one of them is that the foot is trapped or the person is standing on the foot, which is not the case in that situation. Therefore, it could not possibly be a knee reap. But if you read the IBJJF rulebook about how a knee reap is defined, it's the position of my leg with respect to his leg based on my shin and his knee. And then the second requirement is that his foot is trapped, which specifically is worded to include if the person is standing on their foot, it's considered, oh, excuse me, it's considered trapped. <laughs> well, you're like a referee encyclopedia. That's awesome, you just fire that out. So as long as, his leg is free, as long as his leg is free to limp leg out or escape, it's not considered a knee reap. If the foot is free, there is no reap. Awesome. This is why you see people thinking that someone is reaping the knee because they are reaping the knee, but the foot is free. And then they reach for a foot lock and then the ref calls the DQ because it wasn't reaping until you touch the foot. Awesome. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Now <laughs> back to the, the technique that you just did where you're getting requests, if you could do that with your head towards the camera. Yeah, sure. So whether I open my specific way or however I had open guard, maybe I was already looking for a spider sweep or something, but they post the opposite leg. So for this shin guard, I need the opposite leg from the side that I have the spider on. Can you pick this arm up so I can see? So I got spider on one side and they're posting on the other side. It has to be opposite sides. So that I can use the spider to stretch him that way then I can pick this leg up. Can you see, look, I can whoo, and take him that way. But I don't want to take him too far. I just want to take him enough so that this is light. I'm going to kick this and let my foot out. At the same time, I let this slide and he's going to fall right into my diamond guard. There's some timing to work on. So if you're going to drill this, you want to just play with it so that you can feel like if I don't stretch the spider, I can't pick this leg up. When I stretch the spider, I can pick the leg up. I'm gonna kick both at the same time and let the person fall right into my diamond guard. But in reality, go stand up. It's a little faster. You see good? Awesome, beautiful. I see a lot of stuff popping up in the chat. Yeah, they love it. They love it. It's, it's a great technique. We're good to go on that one. Beautiful. Thank you. Let me know. Uh, did you have another technique to show us? Yeah, from that same one, we can switch to omoplata also. Okay. You want to do that one real the quick? Opposite. We have a lot of questions coming in um, that I wanted to ask you, so. Okay. So the same setup a spider hook and an opposite shin guard. I'm still gonna kick this leg, but now I'm gonna lose my spider underneath. So it depends on the, the way that the person reacts. 
So the triangle comes from them not really paying any attention and they just fall because they lost their balance. I kicked out their foot and they just fell right into my triangle. But when they feel me pick up this leg, a lot of times they try to counterbalance by moving that way. So then I can come under and there's an omoplata here. When I go for the omoplata, a lot of people always, they want to turn and lock the triangle like immediately. But again, the same way, like when I'm looking for the triangle, I don't, I want the diamond guard first, then I want my shin, then I adjust everything. So if he goes to move that way to counter, I'm looking for the omoplata. I want to hammer down here. I come over the head. I walk here first. And then I look for the belt so that he can't step over me. And then I can come sideways. I don't even usually ever lock all the way here. I just come straight sideways. And then the technique, the way that I teach it to the lower belt in my women's class to finish is to tell them a secret. I'm going to whisper in his ear a secret. And the secret is you should tap. That's the secret. That's the secret. Awesome. That's, that's awesome. Now, can you, can you tell us why are you biting down on the head before you get sideways to him when you're grabbing for that belt? What does that do? I don't want to go all the way. I like to be like highly more technical in the, in the, the steps of progression from the beginning of the attack to completion of the position that, that I'm looking for. Um, so I clamp down on the back and then I use the other leg over the head all to control their posture. So we know if we're attacking an omoplata and they posture up, we can counter with a triangle, but I've lost my position. So to keep my omoplata, to keep my, my likelihood of progression to complete the omoplata, whether I want to sweep or, or, but still I need to finish the turn. So I, I need to prevent them from posturing up. So I do that by using both legs on the back of their head. I have a, I have a quick question when it comes to that. I, I, I like something very similar. Um, do you think it's kind of mean or douchey if you- Are you gonna push with your foot? If you stand on the back of their head, like that's how I do it, is I put the bottom of my foot on the crown of their head and I hold their head down. Yeah, no, and yeah. I'll put my foot on the side of their face and push to lock also. Yeah. No. That's you my signed a release come. waiver. The answer is if you do it, it is a douchey move. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure like where, okay. I don't know where that line is, so I don't know. In the gym, I probably would not use my foot to push someone's face unless, if you saw me do that in the gym, it's because I was mad at that person. <laughs> uh, but in the tournament, anything goes, so. If I do it to you guys, it's because I love you, not because I'm mad at you. I don't do that to my friends. I, would, I wouldn't do that in the gym. <laughs> That's rude. But in the tournament, I don't care, so. Right. Awesome. Well, I have learned a ton myself that I'm going to drill as soon as we were able to get back to it. Uh, we do have a few questions. Are you, are you, you have some time to answer those for us? Oh yeah, sure. All right. Well, you are a super accomplished jujitsu practitioner, competitor, referee, period. However, some people are interested in knowing how you see the progression or the change in jujitsu from a female's perspective. Have you noticed any change recently? Recently or throughout my time as a practitioner. Right, throughout um, your time. There's definitely been a lot of progression in the competition scene and the, the number of women who are competing. Um, when I was a white belt, there were no master's divisions for women in the white belt division. You had to be a blue belt to fight in any different age bracket. It was just adult white belt and that's it. So my first Miami Open was 2013 and I fought the adult white belt division against 18 year old girls. Um, and then um, we only had masters one, that was it. So it was either under 30 or over 30. Um, so it's just been in the last few years that we've had any masters divisions over master one, which was huge. Um, it was PANS 2017 that we had a big, um, we, I don't want to say we, because I mean, I signed the petition, but I wasn't part of the original movement that started it. Um, but there were some girls that organized and started a petition for the IBJJF to include master two, three, four, five, and six for women's divisions. Again, just for blue belt and up. Um, but so now there is um, master divisions for white belts and you see all the other masters divisions in, in every other tournament, not just the majors like pans and worlds. 
Um, so it used to be that we were all lumped together, which, which really, it's really a big deal to, to fight someone who's 20 years younger than you. You know, they have so much more cardio and stamina. They recover, they train differently. Their, their body is capable of withstanding so much more. Um, especially when we're at like a major tournament and you need to fight three, four, five, turn five matches in a row just to make it to the podium. Like I'm dead after that. And the 18 year old is like, yeah, let's do it again. Like, you know, for sure. <laughs> but, but that's a good sign. That means there's a whole lot more women that are out there and doing jujitsu. Uh, which there's also a lot more girls in the divisions themselves. Um, so even in the lower belts, I had a lot of, of trouble having opponents. I'd have to go up in weight or down in age all the time just to have someone to fight. Um, and I did notice at brown belt, I had a specific issue. Um, I feel like it's just that belt specifically that there aren't that many that get to that level and then they don't stay that level for too long. So brown belt is a, its own phenomenon. Uh, I'd have to go up in weight, down in age all the time and I'd have one opponent some huge 20 year old girl and it was either fight her or I don't get to play. Um, but in all the other divisions, there's definitely a lot more, more girls signing up. So you, you see three, four, five, six names in, in all the different age and weight classes. And, and back in the day, it was not like that. So there's definitely a lot more women getting involved and, and definitely white and blue belts and, and the younger girls, the kids and the teenagers. I mean, can you imagine Mona Bailey in 10 years? Like, yeah, Mona, don't, no. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I feel bad asking you these questions from a woman's perspective because you're just a phenomenal jiu-jitsu practitioner, jiu-jitsu black belt referee, but we have a lot of females on here and they're asking these questions. So I don't want you to feel like I'm asking you these questions because you're a woman because I, I, I admire you on a jiu-jitsu level regardless of gender. But we're, we have a question here from Nikki. She's asking if, you, if you're a woman and you train predominantly with men, will this be a disadvantage when you're competing against other women or an advantage? I think it would depend on the men that you train with. Um, so any guy, even my same size, is going to be a lot stronger than me. Um, he's probably less flexible and has a slightly different game. Um, so it would, it would be really helpful if if I only had male training partners that I would focus on the smaller ones. Um, also from the referee experience, I, I noticed a big difference in the way that um, men compete the, the, the rooster and light feather and featherweight guys. They're super speedy. They love the Barambolo game and the inverted guard game and all that. Um, and then you got like the big heavyweight guys that just want to stand up and go for a takedown and lay inside control and, those are not good guys for me to train with. Um, I've had a lot of injuries throughout my career. Sorry, boo you. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, and, and honestly, almost all of them are from training with guys who are too big and too strong and, and don't know how to control the situation properly. Um, and then I'm always the one that ends up getting hurt. And then I'm the one that has to deal with injury or recovery or surgeries. And then it affects my training, it affects my competition abilities, um, all of the repercussions from that I have to deal with. So I used to feel like I couldn't say no to somebody if they asked me to roll. I couldn't turn down a roll. Um, if someone asked you to roll, you just had to like suffer and take it. I couldn't stop a roll in the middle of a roll. Um, those are just, I guess, just things that I, I felt like it was a respect thing or a, a a lower belt, a rank thing, but um, through the years, I've definitely changed my perspective on that. And I just, I need to take care of myself. I need to make sure that I can train tomorrow. I need to make sure that I can compete next month. Um, so if I don't know someone too well, I, I don't have any problem telling them, no, I don't want to roll with you, you know, no offense, um, but no. And if I'm uncomfortable in the middle of a role, I can stop a role, um, can, can give like a, a crap excuse, like, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. Or sometimes I'll just be like, no, dude, you're too rough and I don't wanna roll with you. Like, I'm, I'm scared you're gonna hurt me. And it's happened so many times. Um, but I know there's a lot of gyms that don't have too many girls that train there, um, which is why I 
put so much effort into the, the gypsy events and stuff to get the girls together. But in reality, those girls have to go back to their home gym and, and train with their, their guy teammates. Um, so my, my best advice would be to not be afraid to turn down a role or not take a role. It's better to sit out or drill than it is to be hurt and to definitely focus on the smaller guys and, and try to train with them as much as possible. Well, one variable that we don't have a lot of girls in our class might be these things that you're talking about. So do me a favor and summarize two categories. One, advice to the guys when rolling with a girl. And two, just reiterate how confident and how comfortable you should be turning down roles, telling them, hey, nope, not comfortable, not doing it. Just give me those two categories one more time. Well, for the girls, um, there, there's, there's no disrespect and there's no shame in turning down a role or stopping a role. It's your body and you need to take care of yourself. If you are scared or concerned or afraid in any way, it, it's always better to, to err on the side of safety and choose to sit out. Um, if things are getting out of control too much, then obviously you should talk to your professor. But on a case-by-case -case basis, it, it's trust your own judgment and listen to your instincts. If you're afraid, just stop the role or, or choose a different partner. Um, also, I would say try to be active about choosing who you train with instead of having them tell you who to go with. So um, some schools, the, the professor partners everyone up and sometimes they're like, oh, get a partner. Uh, but whatever the case is, if you can be more proactive about picking who you go with so that you always go with the smaller people more close to your size. Um, for the guys, I would definitely say calm down. <laughs> um, it's like they're so strong. Like you are so strong, you don't even realize how strong you are. I've had guys pass my guard so hard, they broke my ribs. It's happened multiple times. Just, just from the weight and the power that they have behind their body, they don't realize what it feels from the other side. So I've had them tell me, um, I wasn't using all my strength. And I'm sure that to them, it felt like they weren't. But to me, it felt like a Mack truck ragdolling me all over the mats. And I, I really can't counteract that very well at all. Um, so for guys, when you're rolling with the girls, you, you really have to be super conscious of your, your power and your, 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 your force and the strength behind all the movements that you're doing. Um, and really just focus on the technique. Um, put yourself in bad positions, let her get a certain position and, and see if you can get out using technique and not using force. So that's your opportunity to really see if your technique is there because I don't have any strength to use against you. I only have technique. So you have to meet me there or don't ask me to roll. Awesome. Awesome. So guys, chill out or we put you with Professor Tom. Bad problem for you. And or you roll with him after me and then That's right. You know and, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's 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 huge. It's a great message. I think jujitsu is such a beautiful sport, beautiful art that it's a shame that we scare away some people, not just female. I'm talking about shy guys, smaller guys, guys that don't, you know, that are insecure. Um, we gotta make sure that we're when we're rolling and we're doing these things that we're helping our partner grow, not just smashing people, we need to redefine winning in our own minds. Thank you, Professor Olivia. The next question we have for you here, um, how long did it take you, when did you start jujitsu and how long did it take you to get a black belt? Um, I started training full time in January, 2013 and I just got my black belt last December. Um, Still think blue is a little crazy. <laughs> oh, well deserved. Um, so it was um, just under seven years. Awesome. But I, I mean, I guess it, it's not, it's not exactly fair to just ask about the time. So um, from the beginning, I have trained almost every single day. I usually train two or three classes a day. Um, I compete way more than anybody else I know. I travel, I do seminars, I watch videos, I drill, I make lists, I cross train, I do judo classes, I take wrestling classes, I do private classes, I teach classes. Um, so I'm definitely doing, I've been consistently in all of those years doing a lot more than 
the average practitioner is capable of. Um, My job affords me all this extra time, so. No doubt, you're such, you're one of the most accomplished Ghost Squad Squad competitors. We really, we really appreciate that. And it's very well deserved, really, very well earned. I do have a question about that. The sentiment I'm getting from a lot of the black belts, a lot of the good black belts, is this humility like, ah, Buyu's crazy, I don't deserve this. You, Ninja Bunny, all these awesome black belts. Why, why do you think that is? Well, Buyu is crazy, but in a good way. I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I felt some type of way about my brown belt also, but the black belt just comes with like a, a certain stigma. I've noticed and we've been traveling and we, we visit other schools and it's just different. People, people respect it more. And I feel like I need to, I need to represent even more than I already would have. Um, so I'm wearing this belt and I'm wearing blue use patch and it needs to be, needs to be on point. So well, 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 like the bar is all the way up there and I need to meet it. And I feel like, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I think Oliver carries a little bit. That was, I'm, I mean, I, I'm speechless, Oliver. I'm not, I, I'm very suspicious to talk about you. But uh, overall speaking, it's, it falls a little bit what Oliver said, what Professor Rodrigo Medeiros did on Tuesday. When I started, and then I represent Carson Gracie team a couple of times, right? You don't fight to, like, to fight. You go there to represent a legend a persona that gave his life with uh, everything that he has for jiu-jitsu. As a 16 years old, he was the main one to the family to represent in a valley through the fight, you know? So, and then you look into what you've done when you put it the gi and you tie your belt and you go to compete. So, of course, like for the people that like to compete, and I always, I say, it's not for everybody. It's not meant to be for everybody. And if you do as an obligation, don't do it. Do it to have fun and to enjoy, right? I see myself in that way too. You know, when I step on the mats, I'm gonna give my 100%. If the guy has to to tap me out, he literally have to chase that tap because I won't give up. So yes, I'm fighting for my own way of to think, to be able to beat that guy. But I fight for every single one of you guys as well. You know, like that I represent every single one of you guys as well. So I think she cares a little bit of that uh, in her words, you know, like go there and represent, you know, and put everything in aside and go there to fight. Don't you, don't, I believe everybody on this chat, they fight every day, right? Uh, if you fight with the Gi, you go there, you train on the mats, you, you're fighting. What's the difference, you know? And I definitely second what she said, you know, and we're not training just adults. We're training kids. We're training teens, people that are super shy, like Professor Amir said, you know, that that's a bigger accomplishment, you know, and uh, just for the note, thank you again, Chris, to be able to do this drill with Olivia and get choked out. You are very fortunate that you guys have a partner, a training partner to, to at least like, you know, train and, and doing that, you know, thank you once again. Thanks for having me. I was really happy when you asked me. <laughs> awesome, well, we all enjoyed it, learned a ton. Uh, one more question, if you don't mind, this, it's been coming over here. Do you feel, it's kind of related to what you just talked about, do you feel that people come at you a little bit harder when, because you're a black belt, especially when you travel, since you travel a lot? Oh yeah, the the higher the belt, the harder they come. Um, particularly being small and being a woman, and then being a visitor. Um, so it, I think it's like a, a big mixture of um, I'm visiting, so they don't want to go too easy, and also I'm visiting, so they need to like put on a good show and represent their own gym well. Um, and then also there's some ego behind it. Um, I always get the girls because I'm a woman. They always want to train with me. Um, but the, it, it's different. I don't. I, I I I perceive it different when the the girls ask me to roll. I think it's just because it's a, a higher belt girl, and I definitely get it from the lower belts. I've had a lot of them tell me like I'm the first female black belt that they've met or got to train with. 
Um, but then you get like the random guys who come up like, hey, you want to roll? I'm like, why are you picking me? Like, I'm the smallest chick in the room. Like, why are you picking me? Really? Like, I'm not dumb. Right. Well, that's awesome that you're there to be a role model for those girls. And I promise you, this is the last question. I won't ask you anymore, but this is coming <laughs> no, through it's fine, four, it's times, fine. four times. Since you've had so much competition experience, they want to know how do you deal with pre-competition jitters? That is the reason why I competed so much. Um, my very first tournament was just one match at White Belt. It was the Florida State Championships. The match was over in less than two minutes. Um, not to brag, but I, I dominated the whole match and I, I did win um, the match in my division. Um, and I had those anxiety butterflies for a good three, four days after the tournament. Like, okay, the fight's over. You can calm down now. It's been days already. And I just kept getting like those rushes of um, the butterflies and, and I couldn't control my mind and it, and it really bothered me. And um, I don't like not having control of what's going on inside my, my head. So for me, competition is about, about mental control. Um, and, and I was just like, that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this until I can control it. Um, so the only other time that I, I had an issue was when I had my shoulder surgery and I was out for a while and then I had to come back. So I'm wondering how this pandemic is going to affect it all. Um, so normally I compete so often that competing is just, it's just another day. It's just another tournament. There's pans next year. There's euros next month. There's, there's always another tournament. There's always another major around the corner. It never stops. Um, so it's just like a constant in my life. Um, and then when I take those breaks, then it's, I feel like out of place, like, wait, what, wait, what, what am I doing? Awesome. Um, so I would say compete more, compete more, sign up for every tournament you can just keep going and, and just make it normal. I, I, I love that message. I mean, that, that really speaks to Amir and I personally, um, cause for a long time we both you know, uh, competed in Taekwondo and MMA and then Jiu Jitsu. And for that exact reason, because we were so scared of it, because it messed with our head. And, you know, in your regular life, you're like, I control what's going on around me. And you're like, why can't I control this thing that wants to yell at me? Like, oh, you're going to get smashed. You're going to lose. You're going to, you're not good enough for this. Like, shut up already. And so we would compete. And I think it was just to control that noise that, you know, that voice that tells you to stop. So I love that that happens to you and the fact that you're able to, to share this with everybody else because it's something we all probably share at least to some degree. So that's a, that's a fantastic message for everybody. You, you know what I do, I can specifically say in my head, um, when those thoughts come in, like the person I'm fighting, what's gonna happen, I, I recognize that I'm, my brain has gone to a negative space and I purposely redirect it and I try to, I, I mental drill. So instead of going down that rabbit hole of like, who is this person? She's been black belt for 10 years. What's going to happen? I'll, I, in my brain, I start drilling in my mind. Okay, I'm going to jump guard and I'm going to Ezekiel choke her from standing. Or like I, I drill what's going to happen in, in the match in my brain. So, but it does require like a, a willing redirection of my thought process. So I, I recognize like, wait, this is a negative thought. And then I purposely turn it into make it go the way I want it in my brain. So that I can use that, that energy positively. Um, the brain burns more sugar than the body for, for the doctors is that, this is what I've been told. And this is why when, when, you, when you have um, anxiety and um, a lot of emotional stress, it's really exhausting, even though you didn't physically do any, anything exhausting, but you're so tired because your brain burned it all up. So if you entertain those negative thoughts, you're just burning energy, tiring yourself out, and you're not being productive. So redirect it. Yeah, in the in the old days, Amir and I, we would. Uh, I, I remember we would have to weigh in at night the day before the competition or whatever, and so you spend the whole day in the movie theater just to like, you know, kind of. You wouldn't think about anything but whatever's going on because as soon as you had free time with your mind, that's where it would go. You scared me, bro. I thought you were going to tell him some of the other stories. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I, I cried to him and tried to figure out a way out, maybe try to sneak out, maybe bend over while I'm warming up, hit my head on the sink so I don't have to fight. It's crazy what your mind does. But before we go, Olivia, I know we've kept you guys so long. 
thank you so much. I have learned so much that I'm going to drill myself. Uh, the, the technical stuff, the mental stuff, beautiful. But before you go, can you please tell people how they could follow you and find you on social media? Um, yeah, I'm Livy Bogart BJJ on Instagram. Um, Olivia Leda on Facebook. Or also Jiu-Jitsu Gypsies on Instagram and Facebook. I don't really tweet much. Just Instagram and Facebook. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Buyu. He's going to sign us out here. Thank you. Just want to say thank you, everybody that show up, that stay here, you know, like uh, every Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, I know it's a big effort for a lot of people, you know, uh, show up in our meetings. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's important that we get together at least so we can, you know, share some thoughts, some laughs, you know, but at the end of the day, like, this is our community that we are building. And like she said about Mona, the, the, the girl that trains jujitsu, imagine her like in 10 years, you know, like she's going to be amazing, phenomenal, you know, and I hopefully God can give me like a healthy to see not just her, but see all the girls training, all the guys training healthy, because that's what I wish to everyone, you know. I wish for you guys when I wish to myself, you know. I don't wish no harm to nobody else. I just wish like everybody has great time, great uh, doing your hobbies, whatever you guys like it. Um, I'm totally supportive for all my students' uh, activities. Uh, Olivia has the gypsy. Uh, one of my geese, not this one, because it's Washington, has the patch. You know, I always make sure I'm proud to wear Tom's, um, my students, you know, and that's how it is. I'm not telling you to guys do what I do, but uh, I, yes, that patch, I have it. <laughs> um, I don't tell you guys to do what I do. I just do because that's the way, that's the right way. You know, you have to do what is right. Even people tell, oh, no, this and that. No, no, no. You got to do what's right. You know, so thank you very much for everybody that's here. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Olivia. Take care. Love guys. you, guys. Fantastic class, Olivia. Thank you so much. Thank you.